Praise God. You know, we are to give glory to God even today, though many of people are away, holidays and all. Praise God. But there's a brother who came especially, and he kind of stopped me at the back, and we talked about it a bit, and maybe I'll invite him to come. Come, Brother K. Lim. Louder, I encourage him a bit more. Amen. <laughs> okay, come, come. Go and stand here. Come, come. Stand right in front of you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Are you nervous? No, I'm okay. I'm, I'm in good spirit. Good spirit. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, now, I guess maybe I ask you a few things. Uh, you said to me you came to our service last month. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. And what was your problem? Uh, can I just sure, go, go ahead. a bit further back? Okay, go, go further back. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, firstly, hallelujah. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, I'm here tonight again. Uh, as mm-hmm. I mentioned to you, Pastor, I, I came uh, with my wife uh, last month. Uh, I'm back here tonight to give thanks to the Lord mm-hmm. for His good all the time. Uh, what happened is sometime back in, uh, started sometime in August, I started losing mm-hmm. appetite. I, I used to be a big eater, but I, w- I was unable to eat well. I was only able to eat half or less than half my usual, mm-hmm. and I struggle. Um, in fact, my wife uh, was asking me whether is it because of her cooking. I, I said I say no, because even my favorite chicken rice, I couldn't eat also. And uh, I was uh, getting very tired. Uh, I have to take afternoon naps, and I have to... I, I sleep something like nine, ten hours, you know, and I was getting weaker, and uh, eventually there was some ache or body ache or pain at the back and also my leg, and eventually, uh, just a few days before I came last month, uh, the doctor uh, confirms that I, in fact, he says that uh, I'm suffering from uh, an aggressive uh, advanced prostate cancer. And um, and uh, it's it's verified by two two specialists. Um, so I was here, and um, I heard what pastor's uh, message, and uh, it was a confirmation because I, at that point in time, I was already believing that the Lord is Jesus, uh, His finished work by His stripe. I'm I, I, I'm healed, you know, and. Um, uh, and pastor actually gave the message to confirm that and, uh, and told me that I should just give thanks because by his strike, I'm already healed. It's a given, you know, because of his finished work. Mm. And uh, just give thanks. And uh, I, I came to the front and past, I told pastor about my condition and pastor prayed for me and uh, praise the Lord. Uh, it even uh, okay, I, I only started medication uh, two days. Uh, that was that was uh, Friday and Saturday, you know. But on Sunday, I came here on Saturday evening, and on Sunday morning, I was already able to walk with very quick pace, and uh, I have uh, since uh, 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 recovered much strength. I I wasn't able to speak. S- like that, I know I was quite weak, and uh, I have regained much of my appetite, you know. mm-hmm. and uh, gradually my pain also has uh, 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 gone away. And now, at this point in time, the the pain is hardly noticeable at all. Mm-hmm. You know, so it 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 has to be the Lord who has you know it's a miracle, and uh, even my and, and and before that I was so pale, but that night when you pray for me, my wife saw that I I was. Uh, more pinkish and in fact she, she thinks it's the grow you know I was <laughs> touched by the Holy Spirit so just want to praise the Lord and I believe that the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Lord will restore me fully you know to complete health and, uh, and I believe that uh, he, he, he has granted me many 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 more long years to live fruitfully and healthily. Praise Amen. the Lord. Thank you, Amen. Jesus. Amen. Thank, well, thank you. We're going to pray for you before you go. And uh, Kay will be going back to see the doctors to get the final doctor yes. confirmation. Yes. But come, let's pray. Let's pray. Don't worry. We're going to pray for you. Uh, Pastor, 
uh, okay, that night pastor mentioned to me that uh, go back to the doctor and give thanks. And uh, my, my uh, treatment is uh, this injection which will be effective for three months. So uh, when I go back in about uh, two and a half months time, or you know, uh, I believe that the so-called uh, PSA, PSA is the cancer marker, mm. is going to be zero. You Amen. Know? Yeah, man. Amen. Amen. Come, let's lay hands. Hallelujah. Where are all my pastors? All relaxed, huh? <laughs> Pastor Wilfred, so amen. Here he's got. Come, we're just going to lay hands and pray for him. Hallelujah. Come, we all can stretch our hands. And Father, we just want to thank you. As we lay hands on this precious son, even as he's come in faith, even today, Lord, to give glory to you, I want to thank you, Lord, that you have done already, Father, the beginning of a work for not only a healing, but a restoration to complete health even right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, that you have given him, Father, even not just answer to faith to see, Father, even that pain is going and appetite is increasing, but God, we want to thank you as we lay hands on you, that he will come back, God, with a fresh revelation, Father, of you, with a fresh testimony of your glory confirmed by the doctors. So, God, we give thanks even right now. And Lord, when he go for doctors, Father, we thank you to see a good, clean bill of health. Amen. And Father, we know this. You're the God of impossible. And we give you glory even right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, dear brother. Praise God. Praise Amen. God. And Lord, even as we look to your word even right now, we look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Your word is saying, And it shall come to pass in that day. Lord, you said it shall come to pass that his burden shall be taken off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And we give you glory, Father, for this word even right now. And that the word, the yoke shall be destroyed, you said, by the anointing. Holy Spirit anointing, fall afresh in this place. Holy Spirit anointing, manifest yourself in your glory even today. And we thank you, God, that every yoke that's not of Jesus shall be destroyed even today. We speak you, Lord, we speak that you move as a spirit of liberty, as a spirit of glory even right now, Lord, to glorify yourself even here. Lord. And all things we shout the name of Jesus, that the name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that truly you are Lord of all. And we declare this, God, even today, in all that's done and all that's accomplished in this place, that your name alone be magnified, Lord. Your name alone be glorified, Lord. And all things you be lifted high. So God, we give all praise, all glory, all power and honour to you. In your name. In Jesus' precious name. And the people of God say, Amen. And I Amen. Glory. Thank you. Thank you. You know, today we, I just read a verse from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And sometimes some of you may say, what has the Old Testament got to do with us? Isn't that word of Isaiah for Israel? Yes, I won't say something. It was a word in season for the time of Israel. As Israel was under the yoke of the Syrians, they were under a tremendous yoke where the enemy had them bound. And this prophetic word from Isaiah came. A word telling them that it shall come to pass in that day. Now, it happened for Israel. But what is the relevancy to us today? We need to understand this. And I'm preaching the Word of God because the Word of God says, and when His Word is preached, what? He shall confirm it with signs and wonders following. Amen? And we need to understand 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Do you know, prior to that, I always thought Old Testament doesn't apply to us. Yes, we understand that there are things that have been concealed in the Old Testament. Things that are yet applicable right now in us, in the New Testament. Things that were concealed in the Bible, that even that time, the people of Israel could not fully understand. Could not even understand the application to them at that point in time. But there are things that are concealed which are now being revealed as mysteries, the Bible tells us. 
mysteries in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. And these mysteries are not to be concealed anymore, not to be hidden anymore, but ready for revelation through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Somebody shout Amen. amen. And we must understand the Bible, as I started to quote it just now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says, the things that are recorded in the past. Now, all these things happened to Israel. Yes, it had a relevancy to them, but all this happened to Israel as, as samples, as a typology, as something that would be guiding us, bringing an understanding for application in today and not yes, yesterday. Examples for us, an admonition for us to be able to follow us upon whom the ends of the world are coming. Amen. We are in exciting times today. Yes. And Jesus is coming back. Amen. When is that day for Israel? When is that day for us? I want to declare right now that that day for the New Testament believers and New Testament church has already come. When Jesus came, that day has already come. When He came, He was the Word, the Word that became flesh, the Word that was for Israel a dead letter, but to us today, through Jesus Christ, a living Word. A Word that has not only application, that a Word that has tremendous guidance for us. And so we understand this. The living Word has, the Word has become life. And we beheld, the Apostle John said, we beheld the glory of of the only begotten of the Father, the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Because I want you to hear this. Everything we're going to talk today involves the grace of God. Everything we're going to talk today involves the very truth of God. And no grace, no truth comes except through Jesus Christ. Somebody shout amen. amen. And we need to understand this. In that revelation now, that day has come. And as a day has come, what has happened to New Testament believers? If you but believe, the Bible says, right? If you would confess, Romans chapter 9, verse 10, Jesus as Lord. I want you to hear this. If you would confess, the Bible says, Jesus is Lord. Amen? And you believe in your heart that He is the only Son of God that came to die for you. You are saved. Let me repeat this again. Two things, two conditions. If you are able to declare that Jesus is Lord, one. Second, believe that He is the only begotten of the Father who came to die for us. You have been saved. What does salvation really mean today? What is this about this yoke? We, I'm going to unpack this a bit. But what it really means in salvation is that when you accept that, Today, the Bible says, you are a new person already. You are a new person already. The old has passed away. All things have become new. And the Bible says, know you not, that your body is, if you believe in Jesus Christ, a temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said this, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray that God will give you another comforter. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit like me, he said, every way. And what? He will abide with you. But next verse he says even more. Not just abide with you. He is the spirit of truth that the unbelieving world, the unbelievers cannot see, cannot know, cannot receive. But you have. You have because He is already abiding with you. Hear this promise. And in you. He is not only with you, but He is in you. Amen. You know, just before that, I had somebody come up to me and said, Pastor, I'm a believer, but I tell you this, I have problems after problems for more than 10 years. I got problems after problems. I said, hello, what are you believing today? Do you not believe that if you are a New Testament today, believer, he that's in you, the Bible says, 
is greater than he that's in the world. Amen. The very Holy Spirit of God, the very source of the anointing. And the anointing, let me just explain to you in simple words, is about not just the presence of God. God is everywhere, right? Everywhere. But it's about a many faster presence of God. It's about the presence of God that wants to come as it manifests itself upon you. The glory of God that's ready in you can come upon you. And the purpose of this, when that day happens, is that, the Bible says, the yoke shall be destroyed by the anointing. I want to key this word. And the yoke shall be destroyed by the anointing, by the very manifested presence of God that comes upon you. But what is this yoke that the Bible is talking about? What is this yoke? We need to understand the Bible talks about two types of yoke. And the first I want to talk about is, first before I talk about it, is to explain what is a yoke. A yoke is a wooden beam in the old days. An old wooden beam that you see with two arches like this. And what they do is they place this wooden beam on the necks of two animals. And then they harness the two animals to that yoke, which is then with another wood harnessed onto the object they could have put. And this actually what happens is that <clears throat> the yoke will then rest on two animals so that as the two animals move, what happens? There is a combined strength that would pull whatever is behind to be pulled. You see, <clears throat> that's why when a good farmer, he always yokes two animals of equal strength. Because if they're not equal strength, one be pulling like this and one be pulling behind, and there's no combined force. So <clears throat> that yoke is about two that needs to be equally yoked, often used as a Bible. And the problem today is there are two types of yoke the Bible talks about. One is the yoke of Jesus. If you're a believer, you should already be able to take on the yoke of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 and 30, I want to read these words to you. Jesus said these very words, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. As you take my yoke upon you, listen, that's Jesus' yoke. He says, you learn of me. What do you learn? He says, for I am meek and lowly at heart. The word meek is very interesting. The word meek is not weak. Sometimes we think a meek person is a weak person. No. A meek person is about somebody who's got strength and has learned to bring it under subjection and control. In the old days, this word meek was often associated with trying to break wild horses. You know when they capture wild horses? You see that in cowboy movies, right? What happened? They got to break the horse in order that they can then put a saddle on and be able to ride the horse. And that is that process of doing that. It's a process of meekness being imposed. Horse is strong. The horse never loses its strength. But the horse learns to yield his strength for the rider to be able to ride on him. So every time we think of meekness, think of this word of bringing strength under control. How many know that you have a lot of strength? Some people are stronger, some people are less stronger. You definitely have all been given gifts and talents. The Word of God tells us that when you created, you were awesomely, fearfully created, wonderfully created. I like the word. And you know, in creation, understand this, you were created in a very image and after likeness of God. You are not God, but you are created to be like God. But why are we not able to function as the Word of God says? Is it because this Word of God is not true? It's a challenge that we have got to ask ourselves all the time. Is it not true? I challenged it at one point of time too. And as I was talking to God, because I was facing issues at one time and problems, and trying to understand this victory that God has promised through us, through Jesus Christ. And then God led me to this verse, Numbers 23, verse 19. 
after saying God, God, maybe this word not true. You know what he said? Numbers 23 verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Nor a son of man that he's got to repent, say sorry to you. Has he said it? Will not do it? Has he spoken? Will he not make it good? It was a time right now, at that point, a crossroad for me. Either I had to believe that God's word is true, but if God was not working for me, because maybe I've not understood what God is trying to say. And this is sometimes the biggest problem. Because we often come to God with our own upbringing. Whatever you're brought up with, they are going to be the limitations to your moving into the spiritual things of God. Whatever education you receive, whatever religion, whatever cultural beliefs you are brought up with, it's going to limit you. And I will tell you this, yet God wants to give the Holy Spirit as a spirit of liberty. Wants to set you free of mindsets. Wants to set you free so that you can really understand who you are as a believer and who you are in Christ. Do you know this word, in Christ, is so important? If you're in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3 says this. And Paul was so excited, he said, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has already blessed us in Christ with all spiritual blessing. Now, I want you to hear this. All spiritual blessing means all spiritual blessing. And this Bible contains 7,487 covenant promises of men, from God to men. In this, there's promise of healing, there's promise of restoration. Not just healing, but restoration to health. I tell you this, the trouble is we are not receiving this now because we are limiting the very things of God with our lack of understanding. I've seen limbs grow. I've seen a lame walk. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I can go on and testimonies, I'll share some of them. And I'll tell you this, as you see in the Bible, what Jesus did. How could he do it? Jesus of Nazareth came as a man, the Bible says. A man that was born of woman. A man that was without any power. Son of God in every way. But the Bible says he willingly laid aside his divinity to take on frail humanity, to have a body like you and I, without power. But yet at the age of 30, and this is the key, that Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God in every way, came as Son of Man when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, 30 years of age. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Word of God says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. With what? with Holy Spirit and with power. You see, Jesus was without sin, the first man that could be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Today, if you believe in Jesus, the Bible said, in the eyes of God because of the price Jesus paid at a cross in the shedding of blood. In the old days, the Messiah had not yet come. So how were the people to thought? They did animal sacrifices. They had a koban, all those things. But I want you to hear this. When Jesus came, he ended all animal sacrifices because he became the perfect Lamb of God with no sin, tested in all points, could shed his blood. If you believe this today, you have been washed by the blood of Jesus. And today when you stand before God, God doesn't see you as a sinner anymore. Somebody say amen. amen. And when he was anointed Holy Spirit, the Bible says, he went around doing good. Wherever the Spirit of God is manifested, I want you to hear this, the goodness of God will be seen. I want you to hear this again, wherever the presence of God is manifested, the goodness of God is seen. 
and he went around doing good and healing all, the Bible says. All. They were oppressed of the devil. Now, you're going to say to me, but what's that got to do with sickness? What's that got to do with everything? I won't tell you this. Jesus said, my yoke is light. If you take my yoke, what happened? You learn of me. If you learn of me, what happened? The word of God tells us, right? Why? I'm meek. God is saying, Jesus said, I got power. But I'm meek because I brought my power to subjection for your sake. And I'm very lowly in heart. I could be, yeah, he did not count himself. Yeah, he was equal to God in every way. But he became lowly in heart. He decided to bow himself down to offer us the price of salvation. And he said, if you understand that, when you yoke yourself to me, you shall find rest unto your souls. Listen to something. For my yoke, my burden is light and easy. With a yoke, tell you this, in a natural, it needs two animals of equal strength to pull. When you're with Jesus, he brings himself down to your level and his strength becomes your strength. Amen? I won't tell you this. It took me a long time to work it out because here I was as a man, 40 years old, got saved and trying to do things my way. I believe God, don't get me wrong. But for eight, nine years, I tried to keep doing things my way. I love to sing Frank Sinatra's song. I did it my way. <laughs> Until I finally, in 1998, realized there's only one way. And Jesus said what? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. You don't come with your own animal sacrifices. You don't come with all your works. You don't come with anything. Some people can't believe it's so easy. It comes one thing. I just quote it. If you would say, Jesus is my Lord, and believe that he's the only son of God sent to die for you on the cross, you already become a new creation. You are now entitled to all the 7,487 promises. There's a yes and amen. You need promises for restoration? It's here. You need promises for your provision? If you're struggling with your work, I tell you this. I learned what it was to trust God for total provision. He took me a bankrupt at the time, and within a short time, set me free. No more business, no more boring, no more doing things the way of the world. Easy? No. I had to learn of him. I had to learn to be meek and humble than him. I had to learn the meaning of the word. The word was given at a time. The word for the manifestation anointing. <clears throat> it was in the time in the consecration of the temple by Solomon, the temple in Jerusalem, the temple that his father enabled him. David kept all the, all the materials, everything for Solomon to build. At the moment, the temple was consecrated. The voice of God came and said, if my people who are called by my name will first humble themselves, humble themselves, and pray. Many of us, we are still praying without humbling ourselves. When we pray, we are not praying to dialogue with God. We are praying to tell God how He needs to do things for us. The Bible says, meek, humble, humble yourselves and pray. Then what? Seek my face. As you need to seek the face of God, you need to turn from wicked ways. And then what did God say? Then I'm going to hear from heaven. Then I'm going to what? Forgive your sins. Then I will heal your land. Now you know why healing doesn't take place. Now you know why the restoration of God doesn't come. Now you know why the provision of God is not moving. Now you understand the word providence. I never understood the word providence until one day as I was researching the word, 
That word providence in biblical terms is always done with a capital word. Providence is about the person, pers person of God that wants to bring you and I into His destiny. For you to be the head and not the tail. For you to be above and not beneath. Amen? For you to understand that God has a place of value in your life. God has a place of, in that value, a significance. In that significance, God wants you to be the person of influence for Him. I speak to at least two persons here. You have come, but you have yet to confess and believe. And you're wondering, why? Remember? Mindsets. What you've been taught, what you've been brought up with. Meekness. And this is important because as a yoke of Jesus to enable you, the Bible tells us there's a yoke of Satan. Okay, I'll talk about how we can yield to the yoke of Jesus in a minute. But you must understand, Satan is also trying to place a yoke upon us. What is a yoke that Satan has? He wants to enslave us. Keyword, enslave us. When the people of Israel was in Egypt, they were slaves. They had labor increased onto them. They worked no day, no night. Yet they did not understand they were slaves. You see, this enslavement can steal from you every sense of who God wants you to be. I want you to hear this. There's a yoke of Satan which works as a yoke of enslavement. When you are enslaved, what does your do? He's darkness. And he can only think of doing one thing. He wants to bring pain. He wants to bring sickness. He wants to bring infirmities. He wants to destroy God's plan in your life. You know the first thing that God showed man, Genesis 1.26, what is plan for man's dominion? Let us make man singular and let them plural. In this, God's plan for marriage, families, communities, church. Amen. I want to tell you this. God made man singular because God loves you individually, cares for you individually, but God sees plurality. And that's one of the yokes of Satan. He wants to break up relationships. Not only in the marriages. That's why divorce on the rise today. Because Satan knows that he's running out of time. That's one of the yoke of Satan. To ensnare you. To what? Enslave you. To keep you so that you do not understand who God wants you to be. Does God want you in sickness? When God created imperfection before the fall, there was no sickness. When God took Israel out of Egypt, do you know the Bible says there was not one sick person among Israel. When God delivers, He wants to bring health. Somebody shout amen. amen. Not one sick person. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, He brought Israel out of Egypt with the abundance and provision of God. Abundance. Do you know that God even told Moses, you tell the people, go and borrow from the Egyptians. And the Bible says they not only borrowed, they plundered. You know what plundered means? You borrow but never return. That's what happened. Because the treasures of darkness still belong to God. Amen? The devil thought he had it. No, he didn't. So we need to understand. He understands this. And he wants to put all this. He wants to bring pain, sorrow, sickness, infirmity, confusion. He wants to bring even right now lack in your life. The Bible tells us that God's burden for us is light and easy. Why are we living in this world all weighed down? How many know 
that the devil is trying to claim, the Bible says this, to be the God of this world. When he is the God of this world, how can he claim it? He isn't. But he can deceive you. He can use different things. And we need to understand this yoke now. This yoke of Satan, one, first one. If you are making notes, make note of it. It's sin. The word S-I-N. What's the center of S-I-N? I. Today, we are living in a society of I. I, me, my. Right? What does I, me, my do? Fuel sin in your life. Where does sin work? Paul understood this. You see, today, if we believe in Jesus, our spirit man is alive. What happens? When your spirit man is alive, you should be able to bring this body into subjection to Jesus Christ. That it becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? But this body, Paul said the problem with this body is what? Paul, the Apostle Paul, great man of God, minister of God, say, in this flesh dwells no good things. Because of this, what the things I want to do, I do not do. The things I don't want to do, I do. It's sin that brings me into death. In the book of Romans, they talk about death. What? Bondage to sin. And this is important. In fact, Paul came to a point, he felt so wretched, he felt so condemned. What did he say? Wretched man am I. The apostle Paul, great minister of God. Wretched man am I. Who can save me from this body of sin? Let me tell you, Christ has paid the price. You're already saved from this body of sin. But you have still to make a choice. The Bible says, and Paul said, it's a law of what? Life in Jesus Christ. There is a law. I know people said to me, brother, today we are under grace, no more law. I want to tell you this. My Bible says there is the, a law. In fact, I wrote it down. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin, which brings death. I want you to hear this again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I came to give life and life more abundantly. But there's a law that enables you to enter into that life in the spirit that will bring you the fullness of the liberty that will break the yoke of sin in your life. Sin works very subtly. I got people come to me and say, brother, I tried to give up smoking, I tried to give up smoking, I won't tell you this, yet how many times I tried, cannot. I said, why? You have not allowed the anointing because the yoke of sin is still working to your flesh. In the flesh, there's what? Addiction. In the flesh, there's cravings. In the flesh, there's lust. When you are in the flesh, he is the head, the devil. You become the tail. He is above, and you become beneath. You are then bound by what? The law of sin and death. There's no two ways. That's the yoke of Satan. He wants to bring you into enslavement, to bondage that you cannot be. That person God wants you to be. But there's the law of life in the spirit. Amen. But, Pastor, I cannot help it. Uh, every time I go to computer, I get tempted to turn to pornography. Let me tell you something. You get tempted, but you still have the ability to make choice. You say, cannot help. Easy, pull the plug. <laughs> Sometimes you need to pull the plug. Amen. You've got to make a choice. What does the law of Christ tell you? It wants to set you free. So we must understand this. Sin is one area. Sin works to your flesh. 
when he gets you into sin, I won't tell this, he has the ability then to bring sickness. Yes, because the Bible, Romans 8.13 say, For if we live after the flesh, you shall die. I want to hear this. There is no option. If you live after the flesh, you're going to see death. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify, do kill the deeds of the body, you shall live. What's Romans trying to tell us? You have a choice. And when you make the choice, the right decision will happen. The Spirit man in you is going to help you kill the works of the flesh. Yes. All of a sudden, you feel, wow, something's so alive. Something's telling you, no, flee. How many know that it comes to youthful lust? You don't get test temptation. The Bible says you've got to flee your youthful lust. You've got to run away. Amen? Sin wants to bring you into enslavement. Sin wants to keep you there. Remember, there's another yoke. It's sickness and disease. I didn't understand it's a yoke. I want to deal with three major yokes tonight. And then I will end very quickly. You know, the Bible showed us there's a woman with, the Bible used, a spirit of infirmity. This woman, in Luke chapter 13 and 16, Jesus saw it and you know what it said? Ought not this being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for these 18 years, bound with what? The spirit of infirmity. It's a yoke that wants to bind you. And you can't understand why you can't get set free. Even if you go for treatment, cancer, relapse, cancer, relapse. Why? We were just in Penang. We had a lady that came to the meetings. She was not a believer, but she had a very urgent problem. Her condition is that her, all the skin are dry, everything. She's got, I don't know what you call it, but really, I mean, it looks awful. The skin was, what's it called? Surrealsis. Okay, never mind. <laughs> it's a very bad sickness. She came, we prayed, nothing happened. But you see, somebody followed her and keep telling her about Jesus Christ. And do you know something? Although she came to a meeting, the second night when she would come again, she had an even bigger breakout. How many know? Devil uses, Satan uses this to discourage people. But she persevered, she came. Do you know that when she finally accepted Jesus, she had a big blowout. But she stood firm in her faith. She says, no, I have faith now to believe Jesus. And you know what? I just heard the testimony. When she went and washed her hands and took a thing, all the dry skin fell off. I want to tell you, God is still able to do exceedingly abundantly, even above all you can ask or imagine. Sickness, disease, infirmity. I see in the Bible, there was an infirmity of a dumb man in Matthew chapter 9, verse 32, 33. There was even the blind man. And each time Jesus rebuked this spirit that worked through this infirmity and disability. You know, people have come to me and said, I've consulted many doctors. I've undergone all sorts of tests and I've consumed many medicines. Hmm. But there's no way we can overcome this disease, my body. I want to tell you this. I only stand here to tell you. I have seen the impossible happen. I have seen even a woman that had HIV that kept coming back to our healing service in St. Andrew's Cathedral and got set her free. I'm not a doctor. But every time she persevered, she came to a healing service there's a manifested presence of God. It's the anointing that took off the yoke from her. No medicine can heal the HIV today. But your God and my God is still the same God yesterday, today, and will be forever. Amen. Where is that level of your faith to believe? Are you going to stay under the yoke of infirmity? And the last yoke I will touch on, 
I didn't understand it until God showed me. Fear, confusion, and suspicion. You know, fear is one of the things that steal what God wants from you in our life. Fear comes by what? Looking at circumstance, situation. Fear comes from hearing things in the natural. Right? The Bible talks about fear as a spiritual dimension. Romans 8, 14. I want to hear this. God has not given you a spirit of bondage to fear. See, fear is bondage. If you look through the eyes of the natural, you're going to have fear. If you look through the eyes of your flesh, you're going to feel the fear because all the symptoms are there. But God has not given you, listen, fear is a bondage. The spirit, there is that spiritual dimension, there's a yoke of Satan that brings fear. And every time you want to even go closer to God, Satan's going to use that same weapon of fear. And at that point of time, you have to make a choice. Do I believe? Or do I have unbelief and believe in what the devil is telling me? Fear. And I've seen so many people, they get bound by fear. They can't move anymore. Just the other day, I was talking to somebody. You know, he said to me, I'm this age now, I lost my job. So I said, praise God. <laughs> he looked at me, praise God. I said, praise God. Wherever something happens, Here's an opportunity to turn to God and exercise faith. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. I'm now 60 years old. Nobody wants to hire a man like me. You know what I said to him? You're being paralyzed. You have allowed fear now and you're making negative confessions. What you believe in your heart, what you confess with your mouth is what you will receive. Simple as that. I've seen people of older age. There was a man who came here. I can't remember who brought him here now. Yeah, and we prayed for him. And the next month he came back and said, he got the job ready. I want to tell you, God cares for you in every small thing. Somebody say amen. But the trouble is, sometimes we can believe in God. I think it was Frankie's friend, right? Frankie, is that you there? Amen. Right? Your friend that, that God gave him a job after that, right? Yes. Yeah. Praise God. God cares. God is no limiter of age, not anything else. Whatever your need is, God cares. But understand, God is not moved by needs. God is moved by faith. Faith is about what you believe and what you confess. If you say, Beisai, you see Beisai. <laughs> cannot means cannot, right? Right? If you say, I am lost before the battle is even fought, I want to tell you, you have lost. Because the battlefield of the mind is where you already got defeated. If you say cannot, then it cannot. But I want you to hear something. With God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. With men, nothing is impossible. Uh, nothing is possible. Yeah. To all who believe. Amen? And belief is not blind. Belief is always founded on who God is to you. That's what faith is. Faith is about who is God to you. Do you believe? It took Abraham 25 years to come to a point that his God is so great, he can give life to the dead. The author of Hebrews said that when God tell him to kill his son, not for one minute he think that God will stop him, you know. But he so believed his God is so great. And that God is so consistent God said this son is destiny. And even if God tell him to kill it, God had a reason. And he so believed that God can raise even his son from the dead. Amen. He believed that his God can give life to the dead. And the God which can call the things which be not as though they were. You see, it took him 25 years to come to the point of absolute trust in the word of God. But you don't have to wait 25 years today. If you're a believer, the anointing of the Spirit is there to help you. Amen? Okay, now, understand nothing is confusion. Every time you go through a problem, the devil sows confusion. Sometimes you're then, you are in the car, your GPS brings you the wrong place, and now you need to think, you need to start how to plan, and very soon, confusion starts. 
your co-driver sitting next to you will start and then all sorts of confusion. You are took the wrong turning there, you talk to him, and we stand up arguing and what happened? Confusion. What happened? The devil tries for confusion. I want to say, there is this yoke of confusion. Every time when you're going through a crisis, do you go running around like the chicken with the neck cut? I'm telling you, this is how, it's a yoke of confusion. I didn't understand it. And many a times, the, the Lord began to show me how in situations people end up running the wrong way because of confusion. I got so many stories on confusion. One was actually fantastic. It was in the Six Days War. And this man shared it. He was the group, uh, right, the group of mission trip. They were in a hotel when the bombs all started dropping and they were all in the basement. They were English guys. And they were praying together. They were seeking God's intervention. Bombs of the Six Day War when the Arab nations just suddenly attack, you know, Israel. And all of a sudden, one of them, he said this, this guy is a brother of General Wingate. General Wingate was a guy in the Second World War in, in, the Mand in, the, in the Burma well, with the Chindiks. He was one of the Chindiks who went in and fight in the jungles and all. Anyway, he said this fellow was a major in the army. This after the war with a handlebar. And all of a sudden, this man stood up anointing. He said, I see a picture. You know, this is true. The man told me the story, Lance Lambert. He said, I see a picture. And in the picture, I see confusion. And God says, use the weapon of the enemy. Pray confusion. They didn't know. They all prayed confusion. Now, sometimes we don't understand. God can use the enemy's tool to cause confusion. But pray for Israel for peace of mind. No confusion. Now, they forgot all about it. After the war was over, and he was at home. Lance Lambert said he was watching TV. And all of a sudden, this was going on. They interviewed this Jordanian general. Because what happened was, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria agreed to do a three-point attack. Means they would all attack from three directions, and Israel would be doomed. Because the army, and the army of those cannot defend three fronts. So what happened? Egypt attacked. Jordan did not move. Syria did not move. And Israel was able to wipe out the Egyptians with the same army, turn around and whack the Jordanians. With the same army, they whack the Syrians at Golan Heights. And now, here the general from Jordan was being questioned because everybody started pointing finger. He used to blame one another. And this guy said, you know what he said? He said, we are all ready to move. We're waiting for the order from the top to go. But nobody gave order. There was so much confusion. And so they did not move. Let me tell you, that's the same weapon of confusion that the devil used. Amen. When you got to find an answer, you're running around like a chicken, not having even an answer to what to do. Now the next one is suspicion. Do you know suspicion is something where it causes offence. This is a real funny story. I had a lady that came. This was the time of ministering. And this lady actually asked for prayers. I won't mention where and the thing goes, I don't get anybody involved in it. And her husband was a minister. But she said, we love to go on, 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 on mission trip together. Wow, we are always, you know, I think, ministry all the time. Then he said something happened. All of a sudden, I don't know why. I got also suspicion come to my mind. My husband go up to meet somebody also. I'm suspicion he's going out for an affair. No, no reason for it. Huh? Not that the husband was caught having an affair and thing. And every time, everything, this suspicion come in. What does the devil do? Because of that, she get angry. Because of that, their relationship is trying to burst. Because of that, she don't want her husband to go out. She don't want it. And cannot minister anymore. You see, the devil can use even this yoke of suspicion. A lot of suspicion, even a church. A lot of suspicion, even in a home cell group, all those, right? And what does it do? Cause offense. I want to tell you this. These are the three major yokes Satan used. But God has paid the price to set you free. Amen. Now, understand this. It's only this anointing of God, I want to tell you. Only the anointing of God has kept me faithful 
17 years in full-time ministry now as a servant of God. Was there time of suspicions? Yes. I get suspicious of people, intentions also. Was there time of fear? Yes. Confusion? Yes. Was there time of the spirit infirmity? Yes. I want to tell you this, but God has given you the anointing. And anointing comes from what? You make the choice. Do I choose right now to receive the anointing of God in my life? You know what God said to me? To receive the anointing, you've got to learn to hunger and thirst after me. You've got to learn to hunger and thirst for me. Sometimes we get so distracted. We've got time to watch TV, time to do this, do that, do that. But time to hunger and thirst after God, no time. Do you know, I'm just as much flesh. The TV is always one remote away. And now they're trying to increase all that, more and more channels. Now, do you have to go and start, start there's all those different what, junction box that you can get, what, illegally tap into all sorts of things too, right? I want to tell you this, all these are distractions. All this is to keep you away, to make the choice to say, God, I want to hunger and thirst after you. I know, Paul says, we must learn this. Today, we're living in a very consumerism, materialistic society. So much distraction. Have you come to a point and say, God, I know. Only in you alone can I live, can I move, and can I have my being. There are blessings. There's nothing wrong with money. But in everything, the devil brings a yoke. With blessing, he brings you into a love of money. Right? Blessings can be a curse. Because so many people get so blessed they've got no time for God too. Amen. Travel here, travel there. Planning vacations all over. Amen. How many know God is not against your vacation? But God wants you to have time for him. That's the anointing they were for. Whatever your sickness is, I'm not talking about just the anointing as we pray for you. I'm talking about the anointing in your life that can help you walk into the freedom, the liberty of life in the Spirit in Christ Jesus that will set you free. Amen. Let's quieten our hearts.